Blood drips over a flower as rows of severed heads are displayed under the overcast sky. Another prisoner is about to be beheaded in front of the magistrate. The executioner lifts his blade and swiftly brings it down on the prisoner's neck. Beheading a person with a single blow is next to impossible. In most cases, several blows are required to completely sever the neck. The samurai swings his sword multiple times to behead the prisoner. But against all odds, the sword breaks, surprising both the magistrates watching and the executioner himself. Meanwhile, the unscathed white-haired prisoner sighs and wonders why he can't seem to die. He'd killed countless people until now and he didn't really expect to live a long life. A little while later, the prisoner is back in his cell while a woman is writing down the records of his life. The prisoner's name is Gabamaru, born a shinobi in the village of Iwagakyor. He studied only assassination techniques since he was a child. Many lose their lives during training, but those who survive develop superhuman bodies. The woman understands how to someone like Gabamaru, breaking a blade with his neck is a simple task. Gabamaru agrees with her, pointing out that he didn't even have to use ninjutsu to protect himself. The woman asks if he can demonstrate his ninjutsu for her, but Gabamaru declines. The next day, the magistrate orders that Gabamaru be burned in the stakes. Being burnt is normally the punishment for arson. Searing the flesh causes incredible pain, while the heat causes the muscles to shrink which bends the body so severely that bones break. Sometimes, the person is killed beforehand as a mercy. A samurai tries to give Gabamaru mercy before he is burned, but the spear just breaks when they try to stab him. They proceed with the burning and Gabamaru is swallowed by humongous flames. But after a while, he just opens his eyes behind the fire. The still smoking Gabamaru was put back in his cell where he conversed with the woman. He explains that he's not even trying to resist and if anything, he also wants to die. The woman urges her to continue his life story so she can continue her job and write it down. Gabamaru mentions how he was only told that his parents were killed by the village chief when he was a baby. He doesn't know why nor does he have any feelings about it. He also doesn't have dreams since shinobis don't have any great purpose. They just kill as they're told. As to why he was caught, it was because he tried to leave the village. Thus, his allies betrayed him when they were on a job, leading to his capture. The village chief probably ordered them to do it since they don't allow anyone to leave. The next day, Gabamaru was sentenced to execution by bulls. In the courtyard, bulls were brought out which were then tied to his legs. The method not only removes the person's legs but also splits them from the groin to the chest. A samurai starts forcing the bulls to run and the ropes attached to Gabamaru's legs are pulled taut. Yet the bulls are already down and out of breath and Gabamaru is still unscathed. The magistrate is starting to get angry at all the humiliation. The woman walks up to Gabamaru and mentions that despite him stating that he wants to be killed, she observed that he was still resisting. She then asks her why he wanted to leave his village. Gabamaru explains that he was the best in Iwagakure. He had the chief's recognition and married his daughter. However, the daughter was an idiot, being a carefree, naive, and sheltered girl. She turned his life upside down, nagging him to remove his shoes when entering the house, to pray every day, and to say thank you after eating. He got fed up with her since he didn't want to lose his edge. That's why he asked to leave the village. The village chief agrees on one condition. He has to do one last job. After getting captured, he realized he was set up. He then realized it was stupid of him to defy the chief in the first place, so he gave up on life. Later that night, a samurai urges the woman to not involve herself with Gabamaru for her safety. He tells her that he's not only Gabamaru, the former shinobi of Iwagakure, but he is Gabamaru the Hollow, a legendary hollow man, without blood or tears, who killed 20 men when he was arrested. He also tells her that rumors say the shinobis of Iwagakure consume an elixir of life, the medicine of immortality from Shinsekayo. However, she just points out that if he really is a hollow man, why would he fight back so hard that he killed 20 people? Meanwhile, Gabamaru is thinking about what the woman said earlier. He realizes that she was right, he is indeed resisting. When they tried to chop off his head, he reinforced his neck. He wonders why he just doesn't die when he has no more attachments in life. When tomorrow came, Gabamaru was sentenced to death by being boiled in oil. Oil combusts at a temperature of over 370 degrees so it couldn't be kept boiling long in earthen pots. This doesn't matter since everyone dies before that happens, but Gabamaru is now walking away from the shattered pots with his body in flames and unharmed. He wonders why he seems to be enduring it. He should have no lingering attachments left. He should be empty. Meanwhile, the magistrate is shaking in anger at another failed execution attempt. The woman closes the notebook she was writing in and tells the magistrate that she's finished recording the events and is ready to start the next phase at any time. 
The next day, the magistrate leads a bound Gavamaru along a passageway. Gavamaru asks him what kind of execution is awaiting him this time. However, the magistrate smiles and tells him this time, he'll finally shut up. The door opens and what awaits Gavamaru inside was the woman kneeling in the middle of the room. Gavamaru is confused so the magistrate explains that the woman isn't actually a mere inspector. She's a sword tester sent there from Edo, the executioner Yamada Asiman Sajiri. Yamada Asiman is the trade name of the Yamada clan who served as sword testers and executioners for generations. They are master swordsmen capable of testing swords and beheading criminals with a single blow. Sajiri tells Gavamaru that the shogunate has charged her with his execution. Gabamaru immediately foresees his head flying off and he flinches in fear. He realizes that Sajiri is the real deal. He destroys the shackles holding his hands and staggers away. The magistrate gets scared and immediately asks Sajiri to quickly execute him. In an instant, Sajiri is already behind Gabamaru with her sword held high. She brings it down onto Gabamaru's neck but Gabamaru dodges and rolls away. She asks him why he moved since he would have gotten his wish to die if he stayed still. Meanwhile, Gabamaru is holding a bleeding wound on his neck. Sajiri attacks again and Gabamaru jumps over it, wondering why his body doesn't seem to want to die. Sajiri then tells him that through her job, she has been present during the final moments of many. She learned to identify how people truly feel when they're dying. A person's true nature is reflected in the blade. Some put up a brave act until just before their death, some beg for mercy, and some lie to themselves and claim to have accepted death. She recognizes that there is a great emptiness inside Gabamaru, but he lied about one thing. He does have an attachment in life. Gabamaru loves his wife. Her words make Gabamaru's memories flash before his eyes, with how he was truly happy with his wife. He quickly steals a sword from a guard and then dashes to attack Sajiri. Their swords clash even before the guard can react to his stolen sword. Sajiri tells Gavamaru that he couldn't die during his executions because of his feelings for his wife. He's just lying to himself that he has no more attachments. Gavamaru shouts at her to shut up, pointing out that she knows nothing about the world he'd lived in. He shouts out that he's hollow and he attacks again. But in his mind, he remembers how his wife tells him he's not hollow as she bandages his wounds. He answers to his wife that the nickname suits him since he'd grown too accustomed to terrible things. His wife hugs him and answers back that this is not true. He is kind. After all, he's the only one who wasn't repulsed by her face. In their village, men are soldiers while women bear children. They are not allowed to live as people. Her father burned her face so that she'd give up on trying to live like an ordinary woman. His wife then leans over and gives him a peck on the lips. After the initial shock, he gets flustered and blushes. His wife laughs and points at his face, telling him that someone like him couldn't possibly be hollow. Back in the present, the fight continues as Gabamaru insists he is hollow and that he is an emotionless monster. Try as he might, he can never be human. In the past, he earned money by killing people. His wife tried to hide it but he saw she was disappointed. That's why he decided to quit making a living by killing people, and the two of them can just live a quiet life. It's what his wife wants, so he thought that her father, the chief, would understand. And yet, he was thrown away by the chief. He is about to continue attacking but Sajiri suddenly tells him that there is still a chance for him. She shows him a scroll where an official pardon is written. Not only does it dismiss all charges, but it also places one under the shogun's protection. With that, neither the magistrate's office nor the village Shinobi could harm him and his wife. However, it comes with a condition. Gabamaru has to go to the other side. This confuses Gabamaru so he asks Sajiri if she wants him to die. Sajiri explains that there is a land brimming with fertility and joy where there is no pain. This land is known as Shinsenkayo. Since ancient times, people have called it paradise, the other side, and heaven. It was said to be far to the southwest, beyond the Ryukyu kingdom. And now, it's finally been found. It was full of butterflies, flowers, and beautiful voices can be heard singing. It's further said that the immortality granting elixir of life can be found in Shinsenkayo. The shogunate sent a search party there to acquire the elixir. However, what came back was only a boat full of flowers. When they further investigated the boat, the flowers were growing in the bodies of the samurais they sent. Five more expeditions were sent, but none returned. Instead of being scared, the shogunate declares that the land must truly be magical. Thus, the elixir of life must be there. He ordered that expendable people be chosen for the next expedition, meaning criminals condemned to death. 
Whoever brings back the elixir will be pardoned. Sajiri came there to look for potential candidates, someone with skill and a fierce desire to live. She then mentions to Gabamaru that she heard that his wife is still in Iwagakyar, waiting for him. Since the day he was captured, she closed herself off and hasn't spoken to anyone. She then explains to Gabamaru that traveling to a mysterious island with heinous criminals condemned to death and competing with them for a pardon is the only way for him to be reunited with her. Will he risk all that for a life with his wife? The magistrate speaks out and declares that he won't allow Gabamaru to be pardoned. He orders his men surrounding the two to prepare to attack. Meanwhile, Gabamaru remembers his wife's face again. Tears fell from his face and then he asks Sajiri if she still wants to see ninjutsu. Flames suddenly start rising all over Gabamaru's body. After a while, Gabamaru is sitting on the unconscious forms of all the guards while Sajiri holds back the magistrate. Gabamaru tells her that he'll do it. He'll find the elixir of life. In the past, a condemned storyteller asked to be executed while telling a story. Sajiri's father, Yamada Asiman Kichiji, accepted his request. Even after he was beheaded, the storyteller finished his tale. He didn't even realize he was beheaded. It was the perfect blow, painless and devoid of emotion. Witnessing that, Sajiri decided to follow in her father's footsteps. After her training, Sajiri performed her first execution, successfully beheading the convict in one stroke. But afterward, she sees phantoms of the dead clinging to her. Her senior tells her that there's fear in her swordsmanship. Thus, she's making the condemned die painful deaths. Sejiri promises to improve her swordsmanship more. The next time she executed someone, her senior told her to look at her blade. In its reflection, she again sees the phantom of the dead looking back at her. Sejiri realized that her blade is heavy with fear causing the condemned to suffer, which further makes her blade heavier still. She wonders how she can eliminate the doubt and fear from her heart, just like her father. In the present, the condemned criminals recruited by the Asimen are gathered before the shogun. His Excellency Tokugawa Nariyoshi. The criminals start getting unruly, making the samurai worried about what might happen. Meanwhile, Sajiri is looking at the criminals and finding out their identities, ranging from burglars and serial arsonists to heinous murderers. The lead samurai starts telling the criminals their mission, to travel to Shinsenkaio and return with the elixir of life. Whoever completes the task first shall receive the official pardon. Sajiri notices that the criminal's mood immediately changes upon seeing the pardon. He notices that one of them, the serial killer, is getting excited over being given the opportunity to be free and go on a murder spree again. She wonders if she can kill a person without doubt or fear if she knows that the person is truly evil. Meanwhile, she notices that Gabamaru is just yawning from boredom. One of the prisoners, a female Kanoichi, recognizes Gabamaru. She notes that he seems way smaller and more wretched looking than the rumors say. He also has been apprehended too. Gabamaru apologizes for meeting her expectations, while Sajiri herself admitted that she was wary of Gabamaru at first. But now, he's so listless, like he's a different person. Is he just like the other criminals, or is he even more evil than them? She checks her blade, but she shakes when she hallucinates a phantom in her blade's reflection. The samurai next describes to the prisoners the island they were going to. However, the criminals start shouting and getting rowdy again. This prompts the head samurai to order the criminals to remove their masks. They then brought in front an object covered in a white sheet. They removed the white sheet and underneath was a man with flowers and branches growing out of him. The samurai explains that he's the only sergeant who returned alive from a recent expedition. As they can see, he's no longer human. When he returned, he had lumps all over his body, which began blooming the next day. The roughly 60 other members of the expedition are still missing. They also don't have the slightest clue about what's happening on the island, considering that the man before them is their only source of information. The criminals start crying out about how they weren't told how dangerous the islands are. Meanwhile, one samurai insists that blossoming into flowers would be a mystical blessing since it came from paradise. The criminals argue against him and the samurai demand that they be grateful for being granted an opportunity to travel to paradise in the first place. One of the criminals, a young kid, asks how sure they are that the elixir is there in the first place when they don't have any information from the island. The head samurai answers that they can still just drop out from the expedition since participation is voluntary in the first place. A tattooed criminal accepts his offer and walks away from the meeting. But before he can leave, an Asiman beheads him. The head samurai further explains that monitors will be assigned to them when they arrive on the island. After all, all of them are convicted criminals on death row. 
Thus, the Yamada seamen will accompany them as their monitors. If they act out, they'll be beheaded on the spot. Naturally, if their monitor dies, whether by accident or homicide, then they'll be beheaded too. If they return without a monitor, they won't be allowed onto the boat. Gabamaru asks Sajiri if this is true which she quickly confirms. He accepts this quietly, which makes Sajiri ponder if he's brave or just dumb. The shogun then speaks up and whispers something to his head samurai. After receiving his instructions, the head samurai further explains that before they land on the island, they have to reduce their numbers. All of them won't be able to land on the island since the ship's capacity and the number of a seaman available are limited. The criminals are confused by what he means, but one of them slowly speaks out. The scarred young man was choking another criminal and reveals to them that the samurai just wants them to kill each other. He bashes another one's head with a rock and urges the others to act quickly or else they'll be killed. The head samurai agrees with his assessment, saying that anyone who dies there would have been useless on the island anyway. However, he warns the criminals not to untie their hands. A chaotic brawl ensues, with criminals breaking each other's necks, kicking each other, and bashing each other's heads with a rock. Sajiri surveys the chaos, while Gabamaru just sits quietly in his spot. As the fighting continues, more and more criminals die. The shogun is enjoying the show since he doesn't often see fights to the death in their day and age. Meanwhile, the head samurai holds the shogun in contempt since there's no point in watching the brawl. With their hands tied, the criminals can't even fight properly. It's just a chaotic free-for-all. The shogun then asks another samurai which of the criminals has red seals. These denote the criminals with exceptional skills that might even border on superpowers. The samurai points them out one by one. First is the blonde-haired scarred man who started the brawl. Despite his young age, he led a group of bandits. He's an extraordinary fellow who established a bandit village deep in the mountains of Io. Next, the woman who recognized Gabamaru. She was involved in the invasion of Sajua Castle. She's a Kanoichi who neutralized every last retainer in the castle. Then, a long-haired master swordsman known as the Blade Dragon. Next, a massive fellow said to eat bear's head first. Rumors say neither swords nor spears were effective against him. Among them, the most notable is the living legend, Gabamaru the Hollow. However, when the samurai points at him, they are confused since he's just standing in the middle of the brawl, not moving. On the sideline, Sajiri's senior, Izan, asks if she's feeling overwhelmed. Izan points out to her that it will be even more brutal on the island, not just among criminals, but she'll be exposed to harm as well. When that happens, will she be able to kill? He then further tells her that she's not suited to their job. Sajiri gets hurt but she cannot answer back. Izan asks her why she bothered to wield a sword. The daughter of a warrior should live quietly in her mansion and stay far away from the fate of an executioner. Sajiri takes a deep breath and replies to him that if she could have, she would. However, even when they were young, she already knew that everyone born into the Yamada clan makes their living through people's deaths. Testing swords on bodies, beheading criminals, and making medicines from corpses are their future. Kids chased her all around and threw rocks at her, all the while calling her daughter of Neck Chopper a sack. She can try to turn a blind eye to it but the truth is reflected in the blade. Back in the present, a group of criminals plan to break out of the enclosure. They see Sajiri and decide to attack and steal her sword since she's a woman. Izan steps in to kill them but Sajiri stops him. Instead, she approaches them herself. She recalls how in the past, she cannot escape the executioner's fate. But she won't quietly accept it either and instead, she'll find her own fate. She readies her sword and prepares to attack. She feels her fear surfacing again but she still beheads the criminals charging at her. She wonders why her fear keeps clawing at her but then, she suddenly hears Gabamaru telling her that killing people is never okay. Gabamaru is now addressing the shogun and asking him if he can't come up with another way to choose who's going. They might be murderers, but not all of them killed because they wanted to. His guard gets angry at him for addressing the shogun so plainly, but Gabamaru repeats how killing people if you don't have to is the most natural thing in the world. Meanwhile, the head samurai orders a group of criminals to kill Gabamaru. If they succeed, they automatically get to join the expedition. The criminal gladly accepts his offer and picks up a rock. Gabamaru tries to reason out with them but the criminal answers back that he has no problems with killing if it means he'll survive. He throws the stone at Gabamaru but Gabamaru just dodges it. Left with no choice, Gabamaru sighs and decides that he'll have to fight back. The criminal asks him why when he thought Gabamaru didn't want to kill anyone but Gabamaru replies that he cannot afford to die either. Just thinking about what he's about to be burdened with weighs heavily on his mind. He then suddenly slashes at the criminal with his hands, ripping out his throat. 
He consequently attacks the convicts, killing each of them with a kick to the head or with his teeth. A group of them tries to rush at him but he easily jumps at them and kills them. Their fight brings them to the shore where Gabamaru keeps killing all his attackers, ending the last one by burying his hands in his chest. The shogun and the samurai are stunned by his prowess. It seems that they now realize that the man bathing in blood before them is truly the hollow of legend. Meanwhile, Sajiri remembers how Gabamaru mentioned how killing burdens him, which exactly describes how all her kills weigh heavily on her sword and are reflected on her blade. She wonders if what she needs wasn't the strength not to fear killing, but the resolve to take on the burden of that fear, and the lives she took. A tear falls down her cheek which prompts Izan to ask her if she's okay. He asks her if the responsibility to kill Gabamaru might be too great for her but she hardens her resolve and promises to kill him. The head samurai also announces that all the remaining survivors will be joining the expedition. They are Azucho by the Bandit King, Tamiya the Sword Dragon, Twisted Kayan the Hunter of 100, Nurugai of the Sanka, Harubo the Killing Prayer, Gabamaru the Hollow the Runaway Shinobi, Akajinu the Cannibal Courtesan, Kanoichi Yuzuriha of Keishu, Moro Makia the Apostate, and Rokuroda the Giant of Bizen. Each of the ten convicts will be accompanied by an Asiman executioner. They will board a ship, travel to the uncharted island, and find the elixir of life. They are going to paradise, to heaven, to Shinsenkaio. Even after being pierced by blades and spilling his guts on the ground, he remains standing in place. After witnessing this, Gabamaru can't help but conclude that the chief of their village of Iwagakir is truly immortal. Apparently, it was due to medicine he acquired long ago from a land across the sea. Back in the present, Gabamaru is now in another land across the sea. Gabamaru comments that based on Sajiri's expression, she doesn't think that the elixir of life existed. However, Gabamaru assures her that it's real. He doesn't know if it's in that place, though. The two enter the forest full of beautiful flowers and lush trees. Seeing their beautiful environment, Sajiri remarks that this place certainly makes one believe that the elixir of life might be found there. However, Gabamaru replies that it's creepy as hell for him. There's no rhyme or reason to the species and natural habitats of the plants growing there, which makes it unnatural for him. Not only that, they remember the flowers growing out of the samurai's body. Gabamaru breaks the rope binding his hands but Sajiri tells him he is not allowed to do that. Gabamaru argues that it's ridiculous for them to expect to find the elixir with his hands tied. Sajiri insists that it's not their choice, it's the shogun's orders. She cannot overlook any attempt to break the rules. He instead points out that getting his hands tied isn't the only ridiculous thing about the expedition. They have only been given food and water for three days, and their only clue is a drawing. It seems like they're not actually trying to find the elixir. Sajiri threatens Gabamaru with her blade and explains that she is not his ally, she is his executioner. It's not her problem if he fails to find the elixir. If he refuses to bind his hands, then she simply has to execute him. Gabamaru sighs and agrees for his hands to be tied again. Out of nowhere, a huge metal ball in a chain suddenly hits him, sending him flying. The ball then returns to the hands of another convict, Twisted Kaon. Sajiri is surprised because the Asiman executioner guarding Twisted Kaon is just standing beside him. Twisted Kaon is gloating over his victory when Gabamaru abruptly wakes up again and cracks his neck back in place. Sajiri explains to him that Twisted Kaon is a warrior monk who fell in love with weapons during his training. Rumors say he's stolen over a hundred weapons from other warriors. However, Gabamaru points out that his hands are not tied. Sajiri asks the Asiman executioner guarding Kaon, Kisho, why Kaon's hands aren't bound. Kisho replies that Sajiri is the only one who is as rigid as ever. They can just tie their hands on the trip back. He points out that Sajiri is the lowest ranked Asiman because she's honest to a fault. Meanwhile, Kayan speaks again and tells Gabamaru that he's as bold and stalwart as the rumors say. He plans to test his weapons on him to his heart's content. After all, weapons only shine once they drink blood. He then pulls out a large mace from his bag of weapons. Gabamaru argues that if they fight there, the others would get a head start on them. However, Kayan answers back that that's why he's doing this. They were given no leads to begin with. Thus, he plans to kill the other criminals first and then take his time searching for the elixir. And Gabamaru is his first target. Kisho tells them that they are free to kill each other if they like. They are just there to watch them. Sajiri agrees with him so Gabamaru sighs and decides that he has to kill Kayan. Kayan charges at him and Gabamaru prepares to fight but Sajiri suddenly taps him from behind. 
she orders him to bind his hands. Left with no choice, Gabamaru ties up his hands while Kayan attacks him with all kinds of weapons. Maces break on his head, hammers shatter against his side, and Kayan tries to stab him with a spear. The unscathed Gabamaru just lets him attack and finishes tying his hands. Meanwhile, Kayan also sees this as convenient since he can test all his weapons on him. Gabamaru starts to fight back, starting by lifting Kayun in the air using the very spear he tried to stab him with. All kinds of weapons fall from Kayun and Gabamaru kicks a spear up and into Kayun. Kayun crashes into the ground. Sajiri is amazed that Gabamaru managed to defeat Kayun in a single blow, but Kayun slowly rises, showing that armor was sewn directly to his skin. A few scenes later, Gabamaru is standing over Kan's corpse which was riddled with all kinds of weapons. He then shows his still-tied hands to Sajiri and tells her that they should go and start searching for the elixir. Meanwhile, Kisho draws his sword and beheads Kan. He picks up the head and says goodbye to the two. Gabamaru asks him if they don't need to fight and Kisho explains that they're neither enemies nor allies. If the criminal they're responsible for dies, then they simply take their head back. Sajiri bids him to be careful on the return journey but Kisho replies that he actually considers himself lucky to be able to get home so quickly. Unlike Sajiri who thinks she's safe just because Gabamaru's hands are tied. Kisho tells her that he had already seen so much, mere moments after they headed to shore. Some sought to reduce their competition before they even landed, some plotted to work together, and some pretended to work together. The criminals never followed society's rules in the first place. They'll attempt to survive whatever methods suit them. Sajiri asks him wouldn't the criminals breaking the rules invalidate their pardon, but this just causes Kisho to call her rigid again. To a samurai, the shogun's word is absolute but what really matters is their priorities. Priority number one is the elixir and everything else comes after that. The shogunate would prefer they break the rules to get the elixir rather than them failing. He asks her if he should kill Gabamaru for her, but even before he can draw his sword, Gabamaru stops him and tells him to stop wasting time making jokes. He just wants to get back to his wife. Meanwhile, on the beach, the giant Rokuroda and his guard Izan reach the shore. Rokuroda suddenly attacks Izan, forcing him to fight back. However, his sword breaks against Rokuroda's skin. A few moments later, Rokuroda is already feasting on a dead samurai's body on his feet. In another place, the bandit King Aza kills Haruzo the monk, the courtesan Akajinu is killed by her guards she was trying to seduce, and Moro and Yuzuriha who tried to make an alliance both have swords piercing their body. Kisho also informs Gabamaru that the shogunate probably contacted his old village, Iwagakure, and tells Sajiri that their mission would also probably determine the next head of their clan. After Kisho leaves, Sajiri realizes that he was right. Even though they were traveling together, she still doesn't understand Gabamaru's true character. She is about to ask where they're going next when Gabamaru suddenly attacks her. In the past, Gabamaru's parents asked for permission to leave the village after they have a child. In response, the chief killed them and decided to raise their child, Gabamaru, as his own. He tells the baby Gabamaru that emotions, even love between a parent and child, make people weak. Unless he is strong, he cannot protect those precious to him. Back in the present, Gabamaru remembers his wife's face and attacks Sajiri. She tries to tell him he's violating the rules but Gabamaru answers back that if the Iwagakure arrives on the island, everything will go up in smoke. He has to find the elixir before then, and Sajiri will just slow him down. He then attacks Sajiri again, who realizes that she has to execute Gabamaru. But for some reason, she's hesitant. Meanwhile, Gabamaru is also curious why he can't seem to kill Sajiri when he already had multiple opportunities to do so during their fight. He seems to be hesitating over something. He remembers his wife's words telling him it's normal not to want to kill anyone, telling him to listen to his emotions since he's not his old self anymore. True courage is being true to his emotions. From there, he experienced more emotions after meeting his wife. He even felt hatred when one enemy promised to take revenge on his wife, causing him to slaughter them mercilessly. He is about to kill Sajiri again but his hand stops from slashing at her throat. He wonders what weakness had infected him. He manages to destroy Sajiri's swords with one of his strikes and he implores her to die quietly since killing her would actually hurt him too. Sajiri snickers and asks if he really does have any kind of emotions left. After a long battle, Gabamaru is now sitting over Sajiri's body with his blade pointed right at her throat. He declares that he has no emotions because he is Gabamaru the Hollow. He has killed so many people that he's now tired of it. Killing one more person doesn't make him feel anything. However, his hand shakes and he can't seem to stab Sajiri. The phantom of the chief looming over his shoulders was replaced by the warm embrace of his wife. 
He wonders why he still hesitates when he shouldn't feel anything. Sajiri looks at his face and realizes that the expression he's wearing now is always the expression he has when he has to kill, as though he's trying to endure something. She observes that the environment Gabamaru was raised in simply raised him wrong. He's not a hollow man who feels nothing. He is a human being with emotions. And watching him had allowed her to face her own emotions. Gabamaru tears up and laments how weak he is already now that he can't seem to kill a girl. However, Sajiri answers him and tells him that this is not weakness, it's the seed of strength. She believes not fleeing from your own emotions is strength. Gabamaru recalls how his wife basically said the same thing in the past. Sajiri sits up and tells him that she'll overlook his behavior this time. If he regrets his own crimes, faces his emotions, and struggles to reclaim his life, then she wishes to see that through. Meanwhile, she also tells herself that she has to face her own emotions as well so that she can become stronger. In another part of the island, Tamiya the sword dragon finds a bunch of Buddhist statues scattered around. He notices that the butterfly that landed and stung his arm has the face of a human. He recalls how flowers bloom from the corpse's bodies so he quickly slashes his stung hand. Large scorpions also start showing up around him and his Asiman guard and huge gigantic human-like monsters start walking around. Meanwhile, scorpions are also showing up around Gabamaru and Sajiri as they face off against a monster with a fish head. Known as the Blade Dragon and unparalleled in eight provinces, Tamiya used to look for men stronger than him to fight. When he finally stopped, a lord asked him to become his officer. The lord was a great man who took pride in his great mansion. His family symbol made him a dragon too, so Tamiya agreed to work for him. But during one drinking session, the lord tells him that he might be called a dragon, but he couldn't possibly kill a real dragon. Tamiya took offense to this so he cut down the dragon on the lord's gate. Because of that, the lord's whole clan went after him and he was sentenced to death. Once he acquires the pardon, he'll be cleared of all charges and then he plans to train again until he can split the lord's whole mansion in half. The Asiman accompanying him comments that he doesn't understand him, and Tamiya answers back that the Asimans are the weird ones for beheading people. The Asiman named Fuchai answers that beheadings aren't the only thing their clan does, they also test swords and produce medicine. They also dissect people so they can learn about the human body and help advance medicine. He draws his blade and points it at Tamiya, warning him that he won't allow them to be insulted. The two enter the forest where Fuchai asks Tamiya what he's going to do. Tamiya explains that he's going to eliminate the competition. After that, he can take his time searching for the elixir. And most importantly, he can use his sword to his heart's content. He thought he'd never get the chance to engage in thrilling duels with strong individuals in this peaceful world again. Fuchai agrees with his plan and he compares the job to crafting insect poison. The longer one waits, the stronger the surviving venomous insects or convicts in this case. However, he wonders if this plan will bear fruit when not all venomous insects are there. If the shogunate runs out of patience, they'll send the next batch of insects. That's how they ended up in their current situation where monsters start appearing one by one. Gabamaru wonders what kind of creature stands before him now. It has the head of a fish but it's also wearing prayer beads around its six arms. His instincts however are warning him that whatever it is, it's dangerous. The monster breaks off the prayer beads in his arm and attacks Gabamaru with all his six fists. Gabamaru jumps over them and kicks the head of the fish. The fish manages to grab him by the feet and throw him back to the ground. He stands back up and remembers their chief's teaching, Shinobi rule number five, don't fight an unknown enemy. He wonders if he should just run or if he should bring Sajiri with him. The fish monster then wraps his tail around Gabamaru and flails him around. He was thrown yet again and Sajiri checks up on him. Gabamaru sees his hand bleeding so he tells Sajiri that they should run for now. Unfortunately for them, huge looming monsters with weird smiling faces start appearing all around them. They have been surrounded. Gabamaru activates his ninjutsu and starts attacking the monsters one by one. Sajiri is stunned by the otherworldly scene she's seeing. She wonders if she's truly in paradise or hell. A large monster slaps her but she manages to dodge it. A centipede holds down her leg and the monster prepares to attack again. Gabamaru realizes the situation Sajiri is in but he tells himself that he should focus on the enemies in front of him first. However, his body suddenly moves and he saves Sajiri from the monster. They are about to be attacked again but another Asiman kills the monster attacking them. A new convict arrived with two Asimans following behind her. The convict introduces herself as Yuzurea the Kanoichi. Gabamaru remembers his wife telling him he should thank someone who helped him, so Gabamaru gives Yuzurea his thanks. He asks her why she helped them when they are supposed to be rivals. Yuzurea approaches him and tells him that he seems super dependable. 
He's still standing despite how much he's bleeding and he even saved Sajiri earlier. Yuzura caresses Gabamaru's chest and tells him that she's so scared of this dangerous place. She'll do whatever he says as long as he protects her. Gabamaru grabs her arm and forces her onto the ground, warning her that he cannot be seduced. Yuzuria sits down and apologizes, but tells him that her offer of working together is actually serious. After all, five is safer than three. Sajiri asks her why exactly she has two Asimans with her so one of them. A senior named Genji explains that he was assigned to Moro but he died when he was fooled by Yuzuria. He then deemed that a single executioner was insufficient to control her, so he decided to guard her too. Gabamaru and Sajiri stare at him, sure that he was just seduced by Yuzureha. The other Asiman introduces himself as Senta. Yuzureha narrates that they ran into crazy bugs, monsters, and statues on their way there. They know just how dangerous that place is. Finding the elixir as quickly as possible is important, but there's no point in blindly charging in and dying without a plan. Sajiri also shares that there's no problem with them working together as long as they both agree. Yuzuria reacts happily to her words and she quickly hugs Gabamaru who brings her to the ground again. Gabamaru tells her that he cannot trust a Kanoichi, but Yuzuria smiles and abruptly pulls Gabamaru to the ground too. She then tells him that there's no trust. They can betray each other at any time. Even if they find the elixir, only one of them will be pardoned. She's just suggesting that they use each other for as long as possible. Gabamaru jumps away and Yuzuria goes back cutely begging Gabamaru to team up with her. She offers her information in exchange for Gabamaru's strength. For example, they seem to think the monsters are a threat, but the real danger is actually the bugs. The human-faced butterflies fly around the monsters, but their nests and behaviors are unknown. Their scales seem to contain hallucinogens and poison. Gabamaru curiously asks her how she knew all that, so Yuzuria explains that she got close to Moro and talked him into it. She tested all these on him. The centipedes are gross, but they can be safely ignored. They only eat dead flesh. There are other bugs too, but they don't attack unless approached. Gabamaru asks what ultimately happened to Moro so Yuzuriha admits that she got him to let his guard down by playing dead and then she killed him. Senta also shares that many of the items worn by the monsters feature Buddhist or Taoist designs. Buddhism and Taoism are different religious traditions so it's strange to see them mixed together. The Buddhist statues are strange, too. He doubts that they are truly in paradise. Sajiri agrees with him since although the monsters seem fantastical, their anatomy and musculature feel like those of living creatures. Gabamaru asks Yuzuria why she seems willing to reveal so much. Is she that desperate to survive? Yuzura suddenly gets sad and reveals that she actually has one younger sister. She's got an incurable disease, but they can't afford any medicine. She became a Kanoichi in order to make money. She endured hellish training but one day, the village chief told her she couldn't do something. And then, they betrayed her. Gabamaru tells her that if she's lying, she should just make her story short. Yuzuria realizes that she was busted and tells him that she doesn't need a reason to want to survive. She just doesn't want to die while she's still young. Gabamaru has one last question for Yuzuria and asks her what she actually did to Moro. Yuzuria recalls how she left Moro with flowers growing out of him but then replies to Gabamaru that she did nothing to him. He then finally agrees to team up as long as he gets information. As long as they're simply fighting together and not fully cooperating. Yuzuria happily hugs him and thanks but Gabamaru brings her to the ground again, reminding her that he's married. Meanwhile, Sajiri, who was watching them, slowly gets sleepy. She ponders about her performance since coming to the island. She lost her bearing against the monsters earlier, and she feels so powerless. She then faints into the ground. Recently, a young man named Toma had become an agent of the Yamada clan within a month of joining it. He successfully demonstrated his skills with the blade, and his instructor Izan tells him that he just needs to execute a criminal, and his name would be added to their ranks. Izan wonders which criminals he should execute but Toma speaks up and tells him he has a suggestion. Later, Toma is walking past rows of prison cells and greets one of them, the bandit King Aza. He tells him that he has come to save his older brother. He had infiltrated the Yamada clan and achieved a high status within a month just to save him. Aza also shares that he endured a month of torture at their hands. Aza asks him how they are getting out since the magistrate's men won't give up easily. Toma smiles and informs him that there is actually a way to make them stop pursuing them. 
he then reveals the pardon that they can get when they complete the Shogun's mission. In the present, Toma is now the Aseman executioner assigned to Aza. The two are facing their own group of monsters. Aza happily attacks the monster while Toma compliments how fast his brother can react to situations. He always has, even when the lord their father served committed an outrage that caused their plan to be disbanded. Even when their mother died while they were living in poverty. Even when their father was executed for avenging his lord even when they were attacked by bandits. He immediately reacts to the situation and ultimately ends up controlling it. He became the bandit king until the day they were surrounded by the police. Aza then ordered Toma to run away and rescue him later. Aza's blade breaks after fighting against a couple of monsters. However, more are coming so he tells his brother that they are slipping through them. They weave and run past the monsters blocking their way. Unfortunately, one manages to grab Toma by the hair. He reaches out to his brother who stopped and looked at him but then continues running away. Toma realizes that this is also why his brother is strong. He attacks the monster grabbing his hair and declares that they won't get past him. The monster standing in front of him suddenly gets blown away when Aza actually returns, now wielding their own weapons against them. Aza thanks Toma for buying enough time for him to pick up a weapon. Out of nowhere, a spear suddenly glances past his cheek, injuring him, and the monster who threw it speaks and tells them that murder is a sin. The monsters start speaking out and surround them, while the two siblings are stunned by this sudden development. Toma shakes in fear and wonders if they are not in heaven, but in hell instead, where sinners receive divine punishment. Aza recalls how his whole life seems to be affected by who sins and who commits a crime. He shouts out that he doesn't care anymore and starts going on a rampage, killing all the monsters with his huge axe. He declares that he'll just do what he wants to do. Toma watches his brother stand on top of a pile of corpses and appreciates how strong his brother truly is. He remembers how when they were kids, Toma was crying since they don't know what to do anymore, but his brother just consoled and tells him he can just follow him. Thus, Aza tells Toma their plan. They will kill every last monster and criminal on the island. Then, they can drink the elixir themselves. Not even death will tell them how to live. In another place, the unconscious Sajiri is being carried by her teammates as they further travel into the island. Sajiri dreams of her father looking at her disappointedly. She tries to ask him why but she just wakes up. Genji greets her and explains that they are currently in a cavern on the island. She was poisoned by the butterfly's scales and lost consciousness. Sajiri stands up and Izan tries to warn her not to move around yet. However, she replies that she cannot do that since she always has to keep an eye on her prisoner. Outside, she was surprised to see the others sitting around as if they were camping. She asks them what they are doing so Gabamaru explains that he's preparing dinner, Senta is mending their torn clothes, and Yuzuhira is lying down on a hammock supervising them. Now that Sajiri is awake, Senta suggests that they go over what they know together. They can eat the food Gabamaru made while they talk. Yuzuhira gets angry when she sees the food, pointing out that it was Kikatsugan, a form of ninja ration. Gabamaru explains that he made them using stuff in the area. While he was out gathering ingredients, he also scouted out the whole island. Unfortunately, he didn't see anything promising in the area that might look like the drawing of the Elixir of Life. Yuzuhira asks him if he knows something about the Elixir of Life and Gabamaru's mind goes back to their immortal village chief. He decides to keep that info for himself and replies to the others that it's his first time hearing about it. Gabamaru then continues explaining that while gathering ingredients, he learned about the various flora. The species are mixed, but they are mostly ordinary plants found on the mainland. What caught his attention was that he found several flowers resembling the samurai who had become flowers. So where did the other samurai sent there ended up? He hypothesizes that most of the plants on that island they are seeing right now used to be those humans. The horrifying news brings down the mood of the group, and Yuzuhira throws the food she was eating at Gabamaru. Gabamaru points out he didn't use those flowers in creating those foods. In any case, he didn't find anything resembling the mandarin fruit drawing thing given to them. Senta suggests that they shouldn't fixate on the illustration too much. The terms elixir of life and paradise used by the shogunate were originally concepts from different cultures. The statues scattered around the island closely resemble Buddhist or Taoist figures. Worrying about religious consistency might be a waste of time. What they should be focusing on is the statues themselves. Does the technology to create stone figures exist on the island? If so, who made them? Do they live here? Sajiri's opinion is that the island is too dangerous for people to live on. The monsters and insects' behavior and ecology are mysterious. When she cut into them, it felt as though they had flesh and bones, but they didn't have any organs. Their appearance is strange as well. 
Parts of other animals are stacked on top of humanoid forms. Santa also noticed that the items worn by the monsters seem poorly made as well. They're religious, but the details are crude. In other words, they are like malformed gods. They are terrifying but also stupid. Gabamaru shares that creatures that can survive without having organs point to immortality. Then it's just showing them that the elixir may be indeed on the island. Senta agrees with him, saying that their only clue regarding the elixir is the monsters themselves. Later, Genji advises Sajiri that she should take a boat back to the mainland. He can assume her responsibility since his own criminal is dead. He points out that Sajiri is a daughter of the Yamada clan first and a samurai second. As a woman, it's her duty to marry the next head of the clan. In her current condition, she will die on the island. Does she have the strength to kill Gabamaru? And her sword, she's already using someone else's and not her own. Sajiri recalls how her own sword was broken during her fight with Gabamaru. Genji tells her that a sword is a warrior's heart, and she has already lost the heart of the Yamada clan. Senta joins their question and asks if they can easily return. Most samurai sent there didn't return. Even if they use a boat, he's not sure if they can escape. Meanwhile, an seaman named Tenza is trying to escape the island on a boat with his convict, Nyurugai of the Sanka. Nyurugai doubts that they can leave because the currents are against them. Even if they can escape, then he will just get executed for failing to get the elixir. Tenza promises to talk to the shogunate on his behalf. He promises to take him home since of all the criminals participating. Nyurugai deserves to live the most. In the distance, they finally see a large boat looming on the horizon. Tenza gets excited but as they near it, they see that it's actually the shipwrecks of all the expeditions that had come before them. They then see mysterious creatures lurking around the shipwrecks so Tenza pulls out his sword to defend them. Nyurugai scolds him since most animals are sensitive to shining objects and hostility. But it was too late, a large tentacle attacked them and destroyed their boat, leaving them stranded on the shipwrecks. More tentacles start appearing around them, and they have to run with Tenza slicing any tentacle that comes close. Nyurugai recalls his grandfather's words to run since he is the last of the Sanka bloodline. He wonders if his current situation is the result of divine punishment. In the past, Nyurugai offered to help a group of samurai who were lost in their mountains. The samurai instead asks if he is part of the Amishi and if possible, he would like to rest in their village. However, the samurai instead massacred their whole village. It turns out that Amishi is a term for those who refuse to submit to the shogunate and live as unique cultures in the mountains. Under the current shogun, they're considered as insurrectionists. After killing everyone, they capture Nyurugai in hopes of torturing the location of the other villages from him. There in the prison is where Tenza found him. He didn't understand how an innocent boy should be executed, so instead, he offers him the mission to join the expedition and live. Among the shipwreck, they are shocked to find another seaman, Kisho, who left after his guard was killed by Gabamaru. Kisho now has flowers growing all over him. Tenza wants to help him but it was a trap laid by the tentacles. Seeing Kisho's dead body, Nurugai kneels and tells Tenza to escape without him. He already accepted his current situation as divine punishment for killing his village. Tenza fights back the tentacle while trying to convince Nyurugai to move. He tells him that he doesn't care about the village or his grandpa, what he wants to know if Nyurugai wants to die. Nyurugai tears up as he remembers his grandpa and confesses that he just wants to live and go back to the mountains. Tenza passes him a sword and tells him that they should just then do whatever it takes to survive. He points to a usable boat in the distance and tells him that they should go there. After a long and arduous escape, the two hobble down to the coast injured and leaning against each other. They rest at the beach and think about what they should do next. Nyurugai observed that the currents in the area probably all flow back to the island. Unless they find a current leading outside, they won't be able to return even with the elixir. The monsters are also different from those found on the island and the mountain of grounded ships surrounding the island is another obstacle. They start washing the blood off themselves while Tenza tells Nyurugai that since boats containing the samurais who'd been turned into flowers returned, then there should be a current leading outside. While washing themselves, Tenza observes that Nyurugai's form seemed to be girlish. Nyurugai asks him what he's talking about when it's clear that she's a girl. Tenza freaks out while Nyurugai teases him and asks him to marry her. Meanwhile, Sajiri's conversation with the other Asiman comes to an end. Genji advised her to leave, while Senta half agrees with him. He also actually wants Sajiri to be there in case Gabamaru needs to be stopped. He noticed that Gabamaru seems different now than when they left, 
and he even saved Sajiri. Sajiri thinks about it and remembers how Gabamaru helped her numerous times. Later that night, Sajiri goes to talk to Gabamaru who was keeping watch. Gabamaru asks her how she's feeling since he thinks that the insect's poison acted quickly because of the wound he gave her during their fight. Not only that, he thanks her for calming him down. Rushing in randomly is dangerous, and if the Iwagakura is coming, then he'd better prepare a counterattack. Sajiri is amazed at his resolve and tells him that he is strong. However, Gabamaru points out that she's stronger than him. He doesn't know if it's heart, technique, or strength, but she seems strong to him at the prison. The next morning, Genji asks Sajiri if she's prepared to leave but Sajiri tells him that she won't be leaving. People regard a woman who wields a sword with astonishment and ridicule. Not only that, her father sometimes looked at her with disappointment. They all want her to live as a woman. But if she lives as a daughter of Neckchopper Asan, she's scorned by outsiders. If she lives as a warrior of the Yamada clan, she's shunned by her family. She cannot stand to be looked at only as a woman. She kneels and asks Genji to see her as a samurai and to allow her to live her own way. Genji smiles and answers back that that isn't how a samurai lives. The island is a battlefield which is no place for women and children. He attacks Sajiri with his sword but to his surprise, Sajiri easily stole his weapon. Genji scolds her and takes back his sword. However, they are interrupted when a looming presence stands behind Genji. It was Rokiroda. Genji quickly pushes Sajiri out of the way and readies his sword. But Rokiroda was faster and swiped at him, cutting away a part of his stomach. As a baby, Rokiroda eats a lot of food while his parents happily watch him. After having a snack, playtime comes next where he stacks some rocks on top of each other. But a few scenes later shows his parents drenched in blood. In the present, Rokiroda's attack sends Genji through the forest and into a tree. Sajiri quickly runs to him and kneels beside him. She tells him that he needs immediate medical attention but Rokiroda just weakly tells her that she should run away. It's already too late for him. When she looked back, Rokiroda was already on top of her about to pick her up. Thankfully, Gabamaru appears and sends Rokiroda flying with a kick to the face. Gabamaru asks who the enemy is since he is practically unharmed despite his attack. Sajiri explains that he is Rokiroda, the giant of Bizen. Supposedly, Izen should be the one guarding him. Gabamaru recognizes that Rokiroda's eyes are like those of a predator who's located his prey. He knows that it'll be tough for them to escape together so he pulls up his mask and prepares himself for a fight. He wonders how he should damage Rokiroda when his kick earlier was ineffective. Meanwhile, Rokiroda rips out a tree from its roots and throws the whole thing at Gabamaru. Gabamaru jumps over it while Sajiri covers the wounded Genji. Gabamaru knows that physically, he is outmatched. He calls out to Yuzuria who is sitting up on a tree nearby and asks her how long she's planning to just sit and watch. He implores her to fight with him, just like how she promised she would. However, Yuzuriha laughs and reminds him that their agreement is for her to gather information while he handles the fighting. She starts cheering Gabamaru on, with no intent to help him. The fight continues with Rokiroda swinging his gigantic hands at Gabamaru. Gabamaru dodges the attacks and he recognizes that Rokiroda's attacks and reactions are fast. He can feel it instinctively that it's impossible to defend against those fists. Touching them would mean instant death. He decides to make it a long-range battle by stamping his foot on the ground and then flinging the broken rocks at Rokiroda. Despite the rocks destroying and boring holes over the terrain behind Rokiroda, the man himself is still unscathed from the attack. Gabamaru concludes that projectiles are ineffective, so he pulls out his cloth belt and uses a ninjutsu, unformed blade. But not even his unformed blade, which is comparable to steel, can make a wound on Rokiroda's skin. He goes through his lift of ninjutsu, but all of them seem ineffective against the giant. In the distance, Sajiri tries to do first aid on Genji by wrapping his wound in bandages. However, the blood just stains the bandage and Genji tells her that this is pointless. She should just run away. Sajiri stubbornly refuses to do so, but instead tells Genji that he can survive if they can stop the bleeding. Genji tells Sajiri that she is a strange person. Moments ago, she was blustering like a man. But now, he can feel a woman's affection in her. Sagari cries out that there is no man or woman right now. She only wants her senior who studied under the same master to die. Genji smiles at her statement and finally understands Sajiri's mind. Rather than dividing everything in two, such as man or woman, strong or weak, she accepts opposing concepts as part of herself. Her conviction is the middle way. He offers Sagari his sword and reminds her that a warrior's sword is his soul. Rokiroda probably killed Izan already. If she is a samurai, then Genji would stop telling her to run anymore. Instead, he implores her to kill Rokiroda. Sagari then accepts his sword. Meanwhile, Gabamaru is still analyzing his opponent. 
close quarters combat is too dangerous, but projectiles are ineffective. If he could get the chance to use his ninjutsu, ascetic blaze, he might have a fighting chance. But Korukota would crush him like a bug if he comes near. If it was two against one, he could find a blind spot. All of a sudden, Rokuroda cries out in pain as his little finger gets cut off. Sajiri has arrived and tells Gabamaru that if one inserts her blade at the junction of extended muscles, tendons, and bones, even the strongest body can be cut. Understand the structure of the opponent's body and strike at the gaps. That is the Yamada seaman style. She brandishes her sword and joins Gabamaru. Senta, who is watching the spectacle with Yuzuriha, voices out that he would like to go tend to his fellow student's wound. Yuzuriha however points out that it's already too late for Genji. More importantly, no monsters have approached despite the noise they are making. As such, it would be more beneficial to observe them. Sajiri notices that Korokota had already stopped the bleeding from his fingers and this makes Gabamaru conclude that they need a single killing blow if they want to win. They have to aim for the gaps between his bones and decapitate him. The only problem is that Korokota's neck is too high up. Thus, they need to split up. Gabamaru suggests that Sajiri cut off Korokota's legs from his blind spot and make him kneel. Meanwhile, he'll handle Korokota's attacks. The next time Korokota attacks them, Gabamaru parries his fist with his kicks, while Sajiri dashes to his back. The face of his senior Izan flashes into her mind and she strikes Korokota's legs with anger. To her surprise, her blade didn't cut. She retreats as Korokota swings his arm at her. Gabamaru asks her if she's alright and Sajiri observes that if she attacks too aggressively just like earlier, her swordsmanship will suffer. She has to remain calm, push aside her emotions, and only use reason. They repeat their plans again as soon as Korukota attacks. Gabamaru dodges his attacks when he notices that his leg was injured. He must have strained it while evading Korukota's blows earlier. Meanwhile, Sajiri attacks again while trying to remain calm but her blade still bounces off Korukota's arm. She tells Gabamaru that cutting through Korokota's bones while he's rampaging about will be difficult. Korokota's movements close the gaps between his bones, leaving no space for her blade to penetrate. Normally, beheadings are performed on people bowing their heads. Thus, killing Korokota with a single blow requires him to hunch over. They think about what their next attack would be when they abruptly hear Korokota's stomach rumbling. Then all of a sudden, Korukota starts crying so loud that everyone in the vicinity was forced to cover their ears. This distracts Gabamaru enough that he didn't notice Korukota's next attack and he was hit full force and into the ground. Gabamaru stands up from the rubble. He was able to withstand the attack, but he starts vomiting a large amount of blood and he falls to his knees. Korukota attacks the wounded Gabamaru again, forcing Sajiri to jump in front of him. She recalls Genji's words about her conviction being the middle way and she realizes that instead of rejecting her emotion and just using her reason, she can just accept the opposing concepts as they are. This allows her to calm herself and deflect Korukota's attack with her sword. She turns her emotions into strength but uses logic to keep sight of the objective. That is the middle way. Gabamaru's eye widens upon seeing Sajiri's strength. Senta, who is watching the fight, also comments that normally, Sajiri's rank is 12th, but their clan ranks aren't determined by pure skill alone. They're assigned according to their suitability to lead the clan, so Sajiri loses rank simply for being a woman. In terms of pure skill, her skill with a sword is better than first rate. Genji also observes that Sajiri may fear the monsters of the island, but as an Asiman, in the face of a criminal, she shows no fear. Sajiri continues blocking Korukota's attack until Korukota accidentally stumbled on the loose ground their fighting had caused. Sajiri quickly takes the opportunity to go behind him and cut off his neck. However, Korukota jumps into the air and back before she can do so. Thankfully, Gabamaru has a new idea on how to keep Korukota's head down, although his idea might be a bit extreme. Gabamaru recognizes that their only option to defeat Korukota is to decapitate him, but doing that requires more than exceptional physical capabilities. He needs the skills of the Yamada Asiman clan, specializing in beheading. Gabamaru steps forward and activates his ninjutsu again, wrapping his body in flames. Seeing this new development, Yuzurea quickly stands up and tells Senta that they need to retreat. Gabamaru starts attacking Korukota again with stone projectiles, but this time, he was wrapping them in fire. Korukota blocks them, scattering them all around the battlefield. He also blows a fireball directly at Korukota, who then parries it into a nearby tree. Gabamaru keeps attacking him with fiery attacks, which then scatter all around. 
After a while, the toll of his technique swears on Gabamaru. Sajiri tells him that it should be enough and any more would be reckless. The fires are now starting to spread and Yuzuria is trying to escape the blazing inferno. She tells Senta that Gabamaru is not just trying to kill Rokuroda now, he is planning to set the whole area on fire. They then plan to use the smoke which is produced by oils and raw wood. By setting fire to branches and leaves, they can instantly fill the area above with smoke. And if Rokuroda continues his rampaging about while crying, he'll run short of breath and inhale a large amount of smoke. The poison in the smoke would then cause him to lose consciousness. In other words, the carbon monoxide in the smoke would bind to the hemoglobin in the blood, causing the entire body to rapidly reach an oxygen-deficient state. Gabamaru also suggests to Sajiri to stay crouching so she won't inhale the smoke. When Rokuroda finally falls to his knees, retching and coughing because of the smoke, Sajiri stands over him with her sword lifted. He tries to slap her away but his hand is stopped and held down by Gabamaru. He shouts at Sajiri to cut Rokuroda now since he won't last long in a contest of strength. Sajiri calmly observes Rokuroda's neck and determines the gap between his bones. She then inhales and in one quick motion, brings her sword down on Korukoda's neck. Before he dies, Rokuroda's life flashes before his eyes. He was just a big hungry boy who, due to his immense strength, destroyed everything he touches. One time when he was hungry, he mistakenly slapped his parents, killing them instantly. He can never understand why he's always hungry, or why no one wants to play with him. Sajiri apologizes to Rokuroda for frightening him and allowing him to go on a rampage. She understands that Rokuroda is just misunderstood and she gently caresses his cheeks. She then closed the eyes of his decapitated head and bid him to rest in peace. Meanwhile, Gabamaru tells her that they should be going now since the flames are getting stronger and it might attract the monsters in the area. Sajiri takes one last look at Genji and runs away with Gabamaru. Memories of her time training and being taught by Genji and Izan flashes in her mind. Later when they are far from the fire, Gabamaru and Sajiri are hiding in the bushes and watching the monsters walking around and heading toward the flames. This confuses them since normally, animals instinctively avoid fire. Gabamaru sighs and suggests that they should head in the direction where the monsters came from. It might be dangerous but they have no choice. The monster's ecology is their only lead on the elixir. Gabamaru also asks her if she's not worried about the safety of her fellow Asimen. But Sajiri states that all of them took this job knowing it could kill them. Thus, it would be disrespectful to be too concerned about them. If she is really worried, then she should just find the elixir so that they can all just finish the mission. While heading deeper into the forest, they see the silhouette of Yuzuriha and Senta. Gabamaru was about to scold them for not helping when he finally sees what they are looking at. It was the remains of a village. Senta comments that if this place really is Shinsenkayo, then hermits probably live in that village. In another part of the forest, Aza and Toma are killing their fair share of monsters. Aza drinks the blood of the monsters to replenish himself while he asks Toma what hermits he was talking about earlier. Toma explains that hermits are a type of superhuman being according to Shanksian philosophy. Most resemble old men, cast mysterious spells, and are allegedly immortal. It was supposed to be them that live in Shinsenkayo, not the monsters they are fighting now. Aza then senses someone in the distance and when they go to take a look, they see two individuals eating and kissing each other on top of a pile of ruins. Did you enjoy this recap? If you did, kindly like this video and subscribe to our channel.